This week is a rebroadcast of one of my favorite episodes from 2019. I am speaking with Forbes publisher Rich Carlgard, and he is the author of Late Bloomers, The Power of Patience in a World Obsessed with Early Achievement. I'm releasing this episode the week of U.S. Thanksgiving holiday. Rather than not publish an episode, I thought I'd dig back into the archives and rebroadcast one of the most impactful episodes of 2019. If you listened to this episode three years ago, I suggest you listen to it again. Cue the music. Welcome to the Repurpose Your Career podcast, brought to you by Career Pivot. This podcast is where those of us in the second half of life come together to discuss how to repurpose our careers for the 21st century. Come listen to career experts give you proven strategies. Listen to people like you tell their stories on how they repurpose their careers. And finally, get your questions answered. Your host, Mark Miller, has made six career pivots over the last 30 years. He understands this is not about jumping out of the frying pan into a fire, but rather to create a plan where you make clear, actionable steps or pivots to a better future career. Are you ready to repurpose your career? Welcome to episode 297 of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. My name is Mark Miller, and I'll be your host every Monday for discussion on what it's like to repurpose your career. This week is a rebroadcast of one of my favorite episodes from 2019. I am speaking with Forbes publisher Rich Carlgar, and he is the author of Late Bloomers, The Power of Patience in a World Obsessed with Early Achievement. I'm releasing this episode the week of the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday. Rather than not publishing episode, which I've done in the past years, I thought I would dig back into the archives and rebroadcast one of the most impactful episodes of 2019. If you listened to this episode three years ago, I suggest you listen to it again. Rich Carlgard published Late Bloomers, The Power of Patience in a World Obsessed, Obsessed with Early Achievement in 2019. There is so much good stuff in here about how society worships early achievers, yet many of us are late bloomers. We do not find ourselves until later in life, but we spend many of our earlier years preparing to become the success we find later in life. Let me read you his bio. Rich Cargard is the publisher of Forbes magazine and the author of Late Bloomers, The Power of Patience in a World Obsessed with Early Achievement. He is also a lecturer, pilot, and the author of four acclaimed previous books. A self-proclaimed late bloomer, Rich had a mediocre academic career at Stanford, which he got into by a fluke, and after graduating, worked as a dishwasher, a night watchman, and typing temp before finally finding the inner motivation and drive that ultimately led him to his current trajectory. Rather than having the usual promotion for the Career Pivot community, let's get right to my discussion with Rich Corregard. Welcome to the Repurpose Your Career podcast. Today, I have Rich Carlgard, the publisher of Forbes magazine and the author of Late Bloomers, The Power of Patience in the World Obsessed with Early Achievement. Rich, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Mark. I saw first you were interviewed by Richard Eisenberg on Next Avenue, and Richard's a good friend of mine. I was fascinated by that. And then I had several people in my online community who said, wow, I got to read this book because we're all late bloomers. With that, how did you come up with the the term late bloomers? And uh, can you tell me how you define a late bloomer? And then why did you write this book? Well, sure. I consider myself a late bloomer. I, at age 25, despite having graduated from a good university, which I got into a fluke, by the way, and I took the easier, softer path, took the easiest courses available because I wasn't ready. I was a junior college transfer, and I took classes like Hold On to Your Hat, Sleep and Dreams, Human Sex, and Film Aesthetics. And and I barely got through. And while my roommates were off doing wonderful things, one was in Stanford Law School about to bark on a career at Silicon Valley's most powerful law firm. Another one had just picked up his master's in chemical engineering and was working for Lockheed Martin. He never talked about what he 
was doing. He couldn't talk about it. And he later revealed that he was working on the space shuttle program. And then a third one went off to Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena and pursued joint degrees in divinity and psychology. And I, at age 25, could hold a job no more responsible than dishwasher, temp typist, and security guard. One night when I was a security guard at a trucking firm north of San Jose, I was making my rounds in the graveyard shift, and I heard a dog barking across the way. And I swung my flashlight around, and there my counterpart greeted me. It was a Rottweiler, and it occurred to me at age 25, my professional colleague was a dog. And a couple months after that, Steve Jobs would take Apple public also at age 25. So I always related to this idea that I was a late bloomer. Interestingly, when I set about to do this book, the, the, the catalyzing motivation was realizing that we bet so much on the early bloomer. In terms of popular culture today, we celebrate the early bloomer to a fairly well. And when I started Googling around for late bloomers, I was kind of disappointed to run into the same old stories I'd been hearing for 30 years. You know, Colonel Sanders starting KFC in his 60s, Ray Kroc franchising McDonald's in his 60s, Grandma Moses the painter in her 70s and 80s. And I thought, good Lord, the late bloomer is kind of lost in popular culture for still telling stories like that. So I decided to really dive into the subject and do a book on it. And I was amazed that there was no clinical definition of late bloomers or late blooming. So I decided to make up one for myself and anybody's free to improve on it. And they're really, I gave it two definitions. One is the late part. The late bloomer is somebody comes into their, into their own. That is, they start fulfilling what they feel is their destiny at a later than an expected age. Now that could be contextual. You could be a late bloomer and be in your 20s, but but around you were people who blossomed in their teens. You could be a middle-aged late bloomer, but around you were people who blossomed in their 20s and 30s. You could be a 50s, 60s, and 70s late bloomer. That, that needs no supportive commentary. You can bloom many times. So what does it mean to bloom? And in the course of doing this book, this this occurred to me late in the process when I was thinking about all these late bloomers that I'd interviewed, I was thinking about my own life. And it really is through a series of experimentation, through a journey that that undoubtedly will beat you up and all those things, you arrive at a destination. Then that destination is your intersection of your native gifts, your deepest passion, and your abiding purpose. And when you can put all three of those in alignment, Suddenly you begin to blossom, you get you, you begin to feel pulled rather than pushed by society's expectations or your employer's expectations. You begin to be pulled toward some sense of who you are always meant to be. I always believe that when I graduated from college, I did exactly what my parents told me to do, which was go I joke, I went to work for IBM or the Borg. And what I claim is very often we went off and we became actors and we play roles through all my transitions. And I've made a lot of them. It, it wasn't until much later that I realized that all this kind of this weaving around got me to where I am today. And I didn't bloom for quite a while. You know, we learn things on our journey, even when we aren't learning. I said that I was a poor student. I managed to go from junior college to to Stanford, but Stanford was a far easier place to get into when I got in in the 70s. And I got in because I was from North Dakota and they needed North Dakotans. <laughs> and I was a decent runner and they needed a decent runner at the back end of their cross country team. And, but I wasn't ready for it, as I said. Even when I was a security guard, most of my security guard postings were not in trucking yards. I was the guy the receptionist replaced at five o'clock and at midnight, somebody would replace me. And I began to read things that I hadn't read before. I read leftover New York Times and Wall Street journals. I read novels, both thr thriller novels and literary novels. I remember diving into the works of Saul Bellow. And that kind of replayed what I did at Stanford when I was goofing off. I couldn't, I just couldn't do my homework, even in 
sleep and dreams, <laughs> Mickey Mouse courses like that. So I would hide in the library and read back issues of Sports Illustrated. So all that reading I was doing on my own, whether it was Sports Illustrated when I should have been studying or when I was reading the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and various novels when I was a security guard at an office building, I was learning the craft of writing. I was learning what really great writers and really great magazines look like. And I was later able to put all of that to work. I just didn't know that I was learning at the time. I was on a journey of discovery. Yeah, I love the story of going off into the racks and, and reading Sports Illustrated and how that helped you understand when you launched your, you know, your financial magazine in Silicon Valley. And I've, 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 that's happened to me three, four times in my career where I've done something and it, I didn't realize I actually, I actually learned something that I'd apply later on. Yeah, and you learn something that you were interested in, and that's the difference. And that gets back to this point about feeling pulled. When you're finally able to pull together all your life's experiences and apply it to some passion and deeper than passion, some sense of purpose, then it all comes forward and you begin to capture that investment that you didn't even know you were making at the time. And that can happen multiple times. It can happen in your, your 20s. Uh, you may have been that mediocre student, but all of a sudden in your late 20s, you begin to blossom. It may be in middle age that for a variety of circumstances, perhaps you're a return to work parent, or perhaps you were in an industry that, or a company that got disrupted, and you're out there having to self uh, reinvent again. And then it can happen in our 60s and 70s when we, many of us, finally get that idea that we we want to do something that really transcends our own mortal life on Earth, and we want to have stood for something. You have a chapter on the strength of late bloomers. Uh, can you tell the listeners what those strengths are? Yeah, I'll, I'll, here's a good starting point. In 2017, Fortune magazine asked some high-level CEOs, CEO Intuit, the CEO of Genentech, a bunch of CEOs that had made their annual best places to work list, what they value most in employees, what are those attributes? And a couple of them led with curiosity. And many others talked about deeper pattern recognition, leadership skills, management skills, resilience, courage, compassion, a lot of nice attributes. And then you think, well, I'll bet your company didn't screen for those when they were initially hiring young people because we've created these barriers that you're supposed to go to uh, not only have a college degree, but have a college degree from the most elite university that you can get into. And all of that makes you more hireable. And yet, these CEOs are saying that's not what they look for. They didn't look for elite degrees. They didn't look for high SAT scores. They look for the kind of people that had the curiosity, had the courage, had the resilience to keep growing. They were looking for people who kept growing. And oftentimes, the early bloomers stop growing. This is an insight I got from Carol Dweck, the Stanford University psychologist, who wrote a great book everyone should read back in 2006 called Mindset, where she delineates between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And late bloomers are often those that have a growth mindset. They have to have a growth mindset because they were not rewarded in their earlier days. The earlier bloomer who is oftentimes gets this idea, well, they now know enough. You know, They always achieve doing what they've done. Why do they need to learn more than that, except for maybe little little additions in technical information or little little uh, uh, additions in management education and so on and so forth. But these later blooming skills are the skills that turn out to be hugely valuable and allow us to keep growing throughout our lives. How can anybody grow without curiosity? Curiosity is kind of the first step to growth throughout one's life. And yet, a lot of these early bloomers are asked to trade their youthful curiosity for a determined focus so that they could get high scores, good grades, and get into an elite university. Yeah, one of the things I've been seeing as I read your book and then I've been talking to people in my online community, the people who consider themselves late bloomers 
often can, can label themselves what I call multi-potentialites, i.e. they had lots and lots of interests and they get bored easily. But because, part of that is that sense of curiosity and wanting to learn that next thing. Does that resonate with you? Oh, sure. Uh, oh, sure. And I think what happens is, as one progresses through life, one becomes a better pruner of those things and, and develops a focus later on. And that's when blooming can happen. And that's very consistent with what neuroscience says, that our brain is constantly pruning and we're losing, we may be losing a little rapid synaptic processing speed and working memory along the way, but we're developing, and this only begins in our 30s, 40s, and 50s, and I could cite the research because it's just breakthrough research and it should be cited more often. But in our, in our 30s, 40s, and 50s, we begin to develop a whole set of cognitive attributes that support management skills, executive skills, leadership skills, communication skills, deep pattern recognition, deeper insights, the kinds of things that we want if we're truly to bloom. And then in our 50s, 60s, and 70s, we develop a whole nother set of attributes on top of that, including you know, everything that supports what we commonly think of wisdom. Angela Duckworth, uh, who wrote the book Grit, said our grit keeps rising throughout our lives. And what that really means is that we become much better selectors of where we're going to apply our grit. Because culture, I think, is rather promiscuous in the way that it tells us to apply grit to practically everything, as in if you get up at five in the morning, do 300 push-ups, you're on your way to a great, fabulous day. Well, who can sustain that over the long run? That, to me, is a waste of grit. I'm not bashing physical fitness in any way. But there are popular culture is just rife with all these, you know, how to how to get and nourish your grit. And what you really want is to figure out, well, where should I really apply my grit? And that's where I get back to this idea of native gifts, deepest passions and an abiding purpose. That's where you want to apply your grit. So we become better editors of our curiosity as we get older. Yeah, I, I loved your chapter on quitting. In fact, I've had several authors on this podcast around that whole concept. And uh, I'm sorry, I grew up in the culture where if you quit, you were a failure. And we know failure is not an option. And that's a mentality that our generation largely grew up with and, by the way, handicapped us. Yeah, winners never quit. Quitters never win. As Lin Vince Lombardi, the great football Paul Coach once said, look, there are certain situations where you can't quit under any circumstances. Uh, if you're a team and you're you're down and you have to make a first down in a football game to even have a hope of winning, you can't quit at that point. If you're in special ops in the U.S. military or in your face of life and death, you can't quit under any circumstances there. But as a life strategy that you should never quit, it takes a good idea that we should train ourselves not to quit when it, when adversity comes our way, that it's a horrible thing to become a quitter, a serial quitter in those circumstances. But what I was writing about is if you look at all the great entrepreneurs, many of them quit many things. Richard Branson quit Virgin Cola when it no longer worked. He quit Virgin Brides. Here in Silicon Valley, where I live, one of our iconic companies from the Silicon era that still is a great company, Intel. The most strategically important thing Intel has done in its 50 years of existence was to quit the memory chip business around 1985 or 1986 and bet it all on the microprocessor. It was getting its hat handed to it in the memory chip business by Japanese memory chip manufacturers and then soon uh, South Korean memory chip manufacturers. And there was a big debate around Intel. You know, its three founders were Bob Noy, Sandy Grove, and Gordon Moore and Bob Noyce, old school, didn't want to quit the memory chip business. He thought he bought into the idea that you never quit anything. Andy Grove, the youngest of them, said, look, this is this is futile to keep pounding our head here unless we can get the U.S. government to raise tariffs or do something like that. We're, it's not working. And this microprocessor, though, it's the smaller revenue contributor to the company, look at, you know, we have this thing called the personal computer that's growing like gangbusters. We can own that market. Let's concentrate on it. And 
Gordon Moore, who was the technologist of the three, didn't often get in, involved in strategic decisions. Both of them asked, Gordon, you decide. <laughs> And Gordon said, well, let's just imagine if somebody bought us, if they bought Intel, what do you suppose they would do? And they both agreed that the new owner would tell them to get out of the memory chip business. So they, they decided to walk out the door, agree that they were not in the memory chip business anymore, and they walked back in the door, and they were now a microprocessor-only company. So yes, I think that amid the amidst the bromides of you should never quit. Quitters never win. Winners never quit. If you're going to bloom, you have to develop a more sophisticated notion about quitting. Yeah, you should never quit as a first sign, first response to adversity. But in any time in your journey, at any time when you're embarking on some project, you're halfway through, there's always an optimal use of your time, your talent, your treasure, and your purpose. And if those are sub-optimally used, then you have to think about, well, maybe at first taking a 10 degree turn or a 20 degree turn and see if that works. And after enough turns, it's no longer working. You have to say there is a better use of my time, talent, and treasure elsewhere and, and you quit. And there's nothing wrong with that because history is replete with people who did strategic retreats and and uh, and pursued something else. A lot to be said about timing. I'll give you two examples. One is I started my first tech startup in uh, in January of 2000, right as the dot com bust, or sorry, yeah, the dot com bust was hitting, and I rode the recession out at a successful semiconductor startup. Versus, I had a good friend who bought a staffing franchise the end of 2007. And she realized by the middle of 2008, she was not going to be able to ride it out. And she got out. And as she looks back, is the smartest decision she ever made. Yeah, you know, uh, somebody our age who had a, a real breakthrough, who wrote a New York Times bestselling book that was on the, on the list for 110 weeks, Daniel J. Brown wrote a book called The Boys in the Boat about the 1936 eight-man rowing team from the University of Washington. Washington. They were all poor Depression-era kids, and they beat the aristocratic schools in the East to win the national championship, and then they went as a unit to the 36 Olympics in Berlin, and they, they, they beat Germany by uh, half a length uh, right under Hitler's nose. Daniel J. Brown published that book at age 62. It was his third book, but he'd never had anything like that. He broke through as a writer at age 62. Daniel J. Brown quit high school. He quit high school because he was having what we now call anxiety attacks. He just couldn't do it. And he ended up working out a deal where he did finished by correspondence. Um, he grew up in Berkeley. He was going to Berkeley High, I think. And he finished his correspondence doing all of his work uh, from the University of California's main library. And there it was that he discovered books. Now, imagine if he would have persisted by staying in high school, which would have, everybody would have said he should have done, where would that have gotten him? It probably would have taken him to a worse place psychologically. Maybe he would have had a total mental breakdown. Later, he entered law school because uh, his dad wanted him to be a lawyer and his older brother was, a, was on his way to being a judge. And, and he quit law school after three days. And he thought, he didn't feel liberated, by the way. He said, I felt full of shame, but I had to do it. So here was a person who quit a couple of things when he was young. And, uh, and here he was at age 62, publishing one of the great nonfiction books of the last 10 years. It's interesting that the, the timing and the decisions we make at one point to quit, and I've done it multiple times, is we didn't realize that how, how big of a decision it was and how critical it was to our later success. Yeah, and you see that all the time with people who take unconventional paths, such as entrepreneurs, artists, writers, and so forth. In fact, if you're going to be a late bloomer, you've 
And you're going to get off societies, what I call this conveyor belt to early success, then you have to take responsibility for that. It's it's not your fault that you're a late bloomer in a culture that worships early success, but it is your fate. It is your responsibility. And now you have the responsibility of setting out on your own your own journey. And along the way, you're going to get beat up. Uh, you're going to be humiliated. You're going to you're going to take a path and find out it leads to a dead end. And then rather than get out a, a big knife and cut your way through, that might be the right decision, but it might be the right decision to quit, back up, and start again. So a sophisticated discussion about quitting is something that every late bloomer, any, everybody on an unconventional path needs needs to figure out for themselves. It's not easy because in, every time you quit, it comes with the risk of reinforcing that you haven't had the, the success that you want yet. You may feel guilty about it and all of those kinds of things. But but quitting is just a tool in your toolkit. Don't overuse it, but use it when it makes sense. So you had a chapter on repotting yourself, which I found was a key topic. Can you tell listeners about the repotting concept and why it's so important? Sure. Where you live, who you associate with, who you work for, the industry you're working in, they all might be wrong for you that they they may constitute a pot of soil or an environment that is not one that's going to bring out the best you there's interesting research that i cited and and i actually got the idea from to cite this research from susan kane's book quiet on introverts she cited this research and and it really inspired me so i decided to dive into the same research and it's this there's a researcher who has this idea that there are some people are dandelions and some people are orchids. Dandelions are the kind of people you can drop into almost any environment and they will thrive. My wife Margie has a friend named Nancy. Nancy is the perfect dandelion. You could you could airdrop Nancy anywhere in the world and within 3 days she would be organizing something and she would have a a list of dinner invitations etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Orchids are the kind of people who can bloom only in certain circumstances. I'm clearly more of the orchid type myself. I was born and raised in Bismarck, North Dakota. The kinds of people who stayed in Bismarck, North Dakota, many of them have done well. Um, They're civil engineers. They build bridges, dams. They work at power plants. They do all of those kinds of things. But that was a bad environment for me. Number one, I was never, uh, my dad was a celebrated high school athletic director in the town. So I was always going to be a little bit under my dad's shadow. Uh, Number two, I'm a person who likes to read books. I'm a person who likes to write books. I'm a person who uh, has been at Forbes magazine for 28 years. And you don't find those kind of opportunities in places like Bismarck. You have to be really in New York or the San Francisco Bay Area. If you're a person who lives in their in, in their head, those kind of big cities or or university towns are better pots of soil. You also have friends that maybe are they they keep you from boredom, but they're not people who really share your ideas about doing something better. They might hold you back in ways that are are subtle. So you have to decide: Do I repot away from those friends or not? You might be in a job, same thing. It's okay. Uh, it's certainly not making you miserable, but you sense deep in your gut that it's not you. It's not taking to, you to the place of your, your ultimate destiny where the best of you can come out. You have to repot. What this reminds me of is one of my favorite books is uh, Necessary Endings by Dr. Henry Cloud, where he talks about the fact that for new stuff to begin – You need often have to end stuff, which includes relationships and all kinds of other stuff. And we don't like ending things. No, we don't. But we have to look, step back and look at if, well, we have to decide on our priorities. Maybe we aren't, uh, maybe we don't feel that tug of destiny or tug of our own, Oprah Winfrey calls her supreme destiny, that we should be doing what we're put on earth to do. 
the fulfillment of our our gifts and our passions and our sense of purpose. But if you have those, if you have just even the the inkling that that is you, that 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 is calling you, then you do have to look at whether where you are, who you associate with, the company that you might be working for, whether they are the ones that are going to support you on this new journey. Some will, some not. Now, I'm not advocating you dump, you know, divorce your spouse or just decide a clean slate. A lot of people who do that, 12-step programs call it doing a geographic. You're running away from your problems and, and then you discover that that you are your problems, that they follow you wherever you go. And so, again, it's it's like quitting. Uh, you have to look at this objectively. You have to, it, it often, on the subject of repotting, I have found that successful repotters, many of them have gotten a great lift by joining peer groups where they can get honest feedback from people who are in similar situation. And they may not be your best friends. They probably aren't your best friends because we all take, we all become, we all act roles around the people that we've been around longest. And sometimes it's hard to, hard to break out of that and have an honest discussion about who we are, where we want to go. Yeah. Every one of my career transitions, which I've made seven, have been what I refer to as half-step career moves. And that is I had one foot in the old world, one foot in the new world, and there was always a relationship that took me across. And it usually wasn't somebody who I knew really well. It was usually the, you know, this whole concept of a weak tie. They, they know people you don't know. Yeah. And that's how support groups are really good. You can find them in, in church. And many churches have them. You can find the whole basis of uh, recovery movement is, is exactly that. Peers who are grappling with the same issue that you are. But I, this half step it, idea, I called it in the book Adjacent Spaces, which is a term borrowed from management consultants. And I wrote about a woman named Kimberly Harrington. Kimberly Harrington was an advertising copywriter and a very good one living in Los Angeles. But at age 50, she realized that she was working in a youth obsessed industry. And as she liked to say, as she, as she said, the cost of being cool in LA is really high. <laughs> yeah. The cost of wearing cool clothes, the cost of having a cool address, driving a cool car, all the things you think you need to do to thrive in advertising in L.A., very high overhead. She wanted something more. She felt something stirring, and that was she wanted to do more serious writing. So she repotted to Vermont. And in Vermont, as she says, people hate the advertising industry. They're all kind of hippies in a way. But it was perfect for her because her cost of living was lower. She wasn't in an advertising industry. She didn't feel tempted in a bad moment or a weak moment to go back and try to revive her advertising career. She kept moving forward because her real aspiration was to write essays and short stories. And it didn't take her long to move her writing skills into essays and short stories. And shortly, she was publishing in publications like Harper's and The New Yorker. Rich. I want to close out this interview. Is there anything you'd like to share with my audience about late bloomers they haven't already talked about? Self-doubt. Here again, late bloomers or, or people that feel that they quite haven't arrived at that place where they're feeling as if they're being pulled toward their destiny rather than being pushed by outsiders or cultural expectations have Self-doubt. Well, everybody has self-doubt, but late bloomers and potential late bloomers often have more of it. So what do you do? Just as culture says you should never quit, quit quitters never win, winners never quit. Popular culture has cheap fixes to self-doubt. Throw your shoulders back, puff up your chest, spend five minutes listening to your favorite inspirational literature, et cetera, et cetera. Do that every day. And you'll become a confident person. Now, I think that doing that might get you through a pinch, sort of a tactic that can be occasionally useful. But as a long-term strategy, we need a way to deal with our self-doubt. And the first thing you must do is wall off your self-doubt from your inherent self-worth. You have inherent self-worth. You're here. You're not an accident. You have 
inherent self-worth, period, end of story. Now, step back and look at how do you look at self-doubt as perhaps a, a, a useful thing? Because self-doubt always shows up at the worst possible moment when you're trying to move your business forward or or trying to make a sale or trying to, you're going to give a speech or something like that. It always descends on you at the worst possible moment. But if you can look at self-doubt as a deliverer of information, self-doubt is telling you something. It's telling you something at the worst possible time. It's selling you something in an annoying manner. But if you can get comfortable with the idea that it's telling you something useful, as in maybe you're not prepared enough, or maybe you need a partner in your business who brings complementary skills to what you do, or maybe you are exhausted and just need to step back, take a couple days off, get some sleep, refresh your brain. If you can learn to use self-doubt as a friend, not an enemy, an annoying friend, Carol Dweck said, think of self-doubt as that annoying person who shows up and tells you something you don't want to hear. Because it's a friend, even if it's an annoying friend, you say, okay, have it out. You listen, then you tell the friend, okay, thanks, go sit down. I don't need to hear it again. I've learned everything you've told me. And then you learn how to, you know, techniques from that, self-talk, self-compassion, framing your self-doubt in different ways instead of saying you're you're nervous about something, tell yourself that you're excited about something. Because probably it's the same adrenaline, right? The adrenaline is pumping through you because you're nervous or pumping through you for excite you're excited. Well, tell yourself you're excited about it. It's going to be a great opportunity and you will learn something from it. So there's a whole chapter on self-doubt. And just as we need to look at self-doubt in a more sophisticated way and see it as a tool, um, it's very much analogous to this idea that we need to look at quitting in a more sophisticated way also. Yeah, when I read the self-doubt, and even the gentleman who's going to be doing the review of your book, uh, we talked about the fact, I have a concept called MSU disorder, make stuff up, mm. is when we, you know, we make stories up when we don't understand or there's a void. And, and, it, and it comes from that, those periods of self-doubt. And the second thing is, as I always talk about, be compassionate to yourself. The, the, very often, the worst, your harshest critic is yourself. And the more you can be compassionate to yourself, that, uh, the better. Yeah, and that's why it's so important to wall it off from your self-worth. If you ever let yourself doubt, infect your self-worth, then things can get pretty bad. And you can spiral down into self-loathing and all of that kind of stuff. So don't ever let that happen. You're the only one that can make that happen in your life. I'm the only one that can make that happen in my life. Nobody can undermine your sense of self-worth. So don't you do it yourself. And then you step back at your point about self-compassion. A good technique is to step back and how would you treat a good friend if they were coming to you in a moment of self-doubt and confessing everything? Would you start dumping on them? Would you start piling on them, reminding them of every failure, et cetera? Well, that's what we do to ourselves. You would never do it to a friend. You'd never do it to a dog. You know, why do you, uh, maybe I might do it to my dog if he pooped on the carpet. You know, you always do that. Uh, but he wouldn't know. He, he's a dog. But but if you step back and, and you consider, yeah, I wouldn't do that to a good friend. I would listen to them and I would counsel them and learn to talk yourself that way. One of the techniques sounds a little corny, but it's validated by research, is learn to talk to yourself in the third person. You know, you're feeling self-doubt. You know, why is, insert your name, feeling this self-doubt now? They should be feeling excitement about this opportunity. When you use personal pronouns, right away you're wrapping yourself up in this and you're getting your your knickers in a twist and, and, uh, and no good comes from that. Rich, this has been great. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time. If someone wants to get a hold of your book, which I hope they will buy lots of them, and if they wanted to reach out and touch you, how might they do that? Well, you can go to richcarlgard.com. Rich, and then Carlgard is spelled K-A-R-L-G-A-A-R-D.com. And it shows you how to contact me. I would love to hear your late bloomer challenges, your late bloomer successes. Uh, I'm going to be starting a website pretty soon that is really user created where we can gather all these stories. I'm inspired by every one of these stories of people who 
achieved unconventionally. They achieved on an unconventional timetable. And people who suddenly realized that they had an opportunity to lean into who they were becoming, not who they were, but who they're becoming. And I think particularly for older late bloomers like myself, like you, when we've done well, we've leaned into who we're becoming, not who we once were. Well, Rich, thank you for being on the Repurpose Your Career podcast. Well, thanks so much, Mark. I personally got a lot out of listening to this episode again. I am a late bloomer. For many of us who are late bloomers, we have to be kind to ourselves. It may have taken a while to bloom, but boy, it's great when it happens. Take a moment, go to careerpivot.com, sign up for the weekly Career Pivot Insights newsletter, which is sent out every Sunday. You will get a weekly update in this podcast, white papers, and new blog posts. I just published my latest white paper, Ageism, The Last Acceptable Bias. While there, do not forget to check out the Career Pivot community, which can be found at careerpivot.com slash community. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Look for Career Pivot on Facebook and LinkedIn. You'll also find me on Twitter at Career Pivot. Thank you for listening all the way to the end of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. You will find all the show notes at careerpivot.com slash episode 297. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Podbeam, Overcast, Spotify, Pandora, Amazon Music, and lots of other places where podcasts can be found. This podcast can be found on the Repurpose Your Career podcast channel on YouTube. I hope to see you next Monday for another episode of Repurpose Your Career podcast.